indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kathy, would you mind? Certainly. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings. We come before you with a grateful heart. Lord, we just ask that you guide us, lead us in the direction you would have us go. Lord, we ask for your mercy upon all those who are affected by this COVID-19. We ask that you be with each and every one of us. I ask all of this in my precious name. Amen. 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 Who would have known that saying the Pledge of Allegiance with a well-fitting N95 mask was as hard as it is? <laughs> I hope they can hear us. Yes, uh, we'll have to speak up today. Um, let us know if we're not. You're fine? Okay. All right. So we'll want to do that. Um, okay. Can we give? Um, we can table the minutes since Mike isn't here. Okay. So we're going to table the minutes of April 28th, the approval of the minutes of April 28th. And uh, we'll move on to item two. In the matter of request for appropriation transfer of funds. Are there any questions or comments in regards to item two? Hearing none. Motion to approve. I will, will vacate the chair in second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of request for appropriation of funds. Are there any comments or questions in regards to item three? Hearing none. Motion to approve. I will second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In a matter of notification from the Ohio Department of Taxation regarding first quarter casino revenue. Questions or comments in regards to item four? Hearing none. Motion to accept. I will second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of 2020 Access Iota County Procurement Policy Revision regarding the Ohio Department of Transportation CARES Act Award. Questions or comments in regards to item five? <coughs> Hearing none. Motion to approve. I will second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of communication to House Speaker Pelosi and House Republican Leader McCarthy regarding Coronavirus Relief Fund CARES Act. Questions or comments in regards to item six? Hearing none. Motion to approve. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of approving payment of the regular schedule accounts for the various funds, moral obligations, and then announced certificates in the total amount of $332,002.03. Questions or comments in regards to item seven? Hearing none. Motion to approve. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of resolution agreement between Board of, si of County Commissioner of Sida County and the City of Portsmouth regarding Sanitary Engineering Department. Questions or comments in regards to item eight? Hearing none. I will make a motion to adopt. I'll second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of accepting miscellaneous notices and reports. Any questions or comments in regards to item nine? Hearing none. Motion to accept. I will second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of resolution authorizing the chairman of the board of Sayota County Commissioners to file applications with the Ohio Department of Transportation for grants to the U.S. DOT Federal Trans Administration as authorized under the Federal Transit Laws as codified 49 U.S.C. Section 5311, formula grants for rural areas, Ohio Rural Transportation Program and Transit Laws as codified 49 U.S.C. Section 5339, <laughs> grants for buses and bus facilities, Ohio's Bus and Bus Facilities Transportation, and the Ohio Transit Partnership Program, executing the contract with the Ohio Department of Transportation upon project approval. Questions or comments in regards to item 10? Hearing none. Motion to adopt. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. <clears throat> In the matter of notification from the Ohio Public Defender regarding indigent defense reimbursement for January of 2020. Questions or comments in regards to item 11? Hearing none. Motion to accept. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. 
And the matter of resolution reestablishing the law enforcement trust fund for the side of county prosecutor's office. Questions or comments in regards to item 12? Hearing none. Motion to adopt. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of accepting an amended certificate from the Budget Commission. Questions or comments in regards to item 13? Hearing none. Motion to accept. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of approving the fiscal year 2018 for use in 2020 certificate of countywide cost allocation plan with Maximus Consulting Incorporated. Questions or comments in regards to item 14? Hearing none. Motion to approve. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of approving the petition for special assessments for special energy improvement project and supplemental plan between the Board of County Commissioners, Side of County, Ohio, and the City of Portsmouth. Questions or comments in regards to item 15? Hearing none. Motion to approve. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of resolution proclaiming Old Americans Month in Scioto County, Ohio. Questions or comments in regards to item 16? <clears throat> Hearing none. Motion to adopt. Second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. In the matter of communication, encouraging Governor DeWine to empower our local health department and elected officials to make community decisions. Questions or comments in regards to item 17? Hearing none. Motion to approve. I will second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Okay. Ms. Coleman, would you have anything additional this morning? I have nothing at this time. Okay. I would add one thing, not to the agenda, but just as a point of conversation. Uh, next week, next Thursday, we have um, some bid openings happening, and uh, that is something that was scheduled well in advance of the COVID. Um, so um, with our changes in our meeting times, schedules, um, I, I figure um, we will be meeting twice next week. Uh, we might want to consider on Tuesday, and we can we can vote then. Um, but we can talk about it then about going back to two times a week. I think if we're starting to see as things start unfolding throughout the community, uh, more and more businesses going back to work, I think it would be uh, important for us to go back to full force as well as, as doing the business of the county, uh, going back to two meetings a week. So um, we can discuss that more on Tuesday, okay. but uh, I think it would be a, a wise thing to do since we're gonna be doing it anyways next week, and then we can do it in subsequent weeks after that, possibly, but we can talk about that, and vote on that next Tuesday if that'd be all right. Okay, um, all right, we have with us today, uh, it's, it's the Larry Mullen Show, <laughs> Deputy Director of EMA, uh, who the, I, I just want to say this, uh, the Director, Deputy Director, of course, Director uh, Kim Carver and, and Larry as Deputy Director have just done an amazing job. And if everybody knew the hours that they spend um, working with the public, working with all the different entities that are involved. It would, it would probably amaze most. Um, their job is not nine to five. It is very much 24 seven. Um, I'm sure somewhere in there they get sleep, but at most times they're alternating that time. So um, they have done a wonderful job in keeping the public informed. I know, uh, Larry, you, you operate several Facebook pages and get information out and, uh, on your personal page as well as Sioux EMA. And, and uh, you know, so EMA also, um, COVID is just one of the things that they're monitoring. Uh, one of the things that I noticed is if there's a storm coming, we know about it. Um, and that hasn't ceased. Uh, COVID is just one more thing that they deal with. Uh, through infectious control, so nothing has been dropped, nothing has been reduced. The activity of the office has has been maintained and actually <laughs> ramped up significantly once uh, 
once emergency management is activated and they're in full swing. So uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to Larry um, and, of course, Kim. Uh, as you notice, she's not here because she's over at the operations center, and uh, she's sending her deputy over <laughs> to, to do the uh, work um, over here. But we appreciate all the work that they've done to date, and I know that they'll continue until we reach the end of this emergency and uh, and we'll move on but uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions uh, the news media that's watching I see a yes I see some heads bobbing there uh, anything specifically for the EMA deputy director though because we're wanting to get Larry out of here as soon as possible today they have a lot going on over there at the operations center and we want to respect his time as well so Brian is there anything that's come up for Larry specifically maybe Maybe. Okay. All righty. Larry, you want to join us over here? He's got his green mask on. <laughs> the question comes from uh, Misty Cook Spicer. Okay, WNXT. Um, if there are any COVID hotspots in the county, will that specific information be released to the public? Larry, go right ahead. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, that's a, uh, a good question. If um, due to the uh, order from Dr. Acton, uh, say most of the hotspots would either be our uh, jails or say like a long-term uh, care facility. And due to the uh, orders that came out a few weeks ago from uh, Dr. Acton and the Ohio Department of Health, if it is in a nursing facility, then everybody has to be notified within 24 hours. And uh, so the, I would assume the same thing would happen with the prisons because they've been very um, uh, releasing a lot of information about you know how many cases. Fortunately, here at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, we haven't had any cases. They did have one person isolated, but they passed uh, the test. and are back in the population. So I would uh, say yes to that question. Uh, of course, that would be up to the health department to let us know that this has happened. So uh, they've been pretty good about sharing information with us. So I would say yes. That's everything I think Okay, all right. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Larry. All right. Uh, I was assuming you'd like to start on the uh, yes. Okay. Uh, you might want to come up to the mic. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. I know you'll keep up the good work over there. We'll try. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. For on the agenda, Mark Craycraft would like uh, item 11, 14, and 17. 11, 14, and 17. Mark Craycraft, Sioux County Daily News. Um, 11 is the Ohio Public Defender's Indigent Defense Reimbursement, and this is for January 2020. Indigent Defense Reimbursement for January 2020. The amount submitted was $82,031.37. The amount rejected was $1,828. The amount approved was $80,151.37. Other billing approved, $3,412.72. The total amount approved was $83,564.09. The amount reimbursed is $71,029.48, and that is at an 85% reimbursement rate. 14, Maximus Consulting Services, Certificate of Countywide Cost Allocation Plan, what that is, is that's Maximum Consulting. We use them every year. It's something that a lot of counties do uh, do this. And it tells us what our cost should be um, per department um, and who should pay for them. So it helps us to be able to determine our budgets, of course, as well as it, it draws a fine line on where funding should come from, whether it be grants or whether it be from the general fund. That's 14. 17. 
Communications, uh, commissioners to Governor DeWine, the health department, elected officials empowerment to make community decisions. And it is a letter uh, to Governor DeWine, uh, basically uh, spelling out, and I can actually get this to the very bottom. And if anybody wants a copy of this, they can get it later today. Um, Dear Governor DeWine, the Saudi County Commissioners are requesting that you empower our local health department and elected officials to have the right to make decisions best for our community. As of today, at 10 a.m., our county statistics are 12, 13 confirmed cases, no hospitalizations, and zero deaths. You and Director Acton have educated the public on preventing preventative measures needed to offset the risk of COVID-19. Saudi County statistics reflect that we as a community have implemented your recommendations and now it is time to empower the individual business owner to have the opportunity to reopen. They have been educated to know how to proceed and we trust them to work with the Portsmouth and Saudi County Health Departments to make the right decision to keep their employees and the public safe. We, kn we know and have evidence that remaining closed is a greater harm to the mental and financial health of our community. We took an oath as county commissioners to uphold the constitutions of the United States and the state of Ohio. It is our responsibility as elected officials to protect our citizens' rights and to provide for the economic and safety needs of our citizens. Signed, and it'll be all three commissioners. So it is a letter requesting that that be the path that the governor takes um, and to let at this point in the, or in the pandemic to allow us to have more local control over those decisions. Uh, we saw some where some counties were taking some directions of, of making unofficial declarations, which I, I, I think if you're gonna say something, say it with teeth. So we're gonna, we're gonna send this letter to the governor and we're working with our legislators, we're working with the Senate, we're working with the House, uh, Representative Baldridge, of course, and Senator Johnson. Um, and we're, we're doing all that we can to get our words to Columbus, uh, representation from the governor's office as well, to let them know that um, our business owners are ready and they feel that the, uh, this pr process that we're going on right now um, is a little slow. It's slow and we need to move faster in order to save jobs businesses and I believe that we can do it responsibly the essential employees have been doing it all along um, and we haven't had a massive breakout or a surge as what was predicted at first so we believe that those that have been defined as non-essential and I think that's a loose term I think uh, every job is important mm -hmm. to every employer and every employee uh, that it's essential to their livelihoods. So we, uh, we feel that by communicating this directly to the governor, um, that uh, we'll, we'll see, see what happens. Hopefully we'll see movement in the legislature, the Ohio General Assembly this week as well, to communicate that fact to the governor. I believe that was the three. Anything else? Uh, Mr. Bill Shope, are you satisfied with the progress of reopening Ohio's economy? If so, why? If not, why? I think that kind of okay. uh, touches upon what we I just wanted to make sure said. he was mentioned. Uh, Mr. Shope, Bill Shope is uh, soda, um, the soda voice and uh, newspaper. And um, I think the one part that we're discouraged by is the, the uh, especially the service industry. The inability of the service industry to open up quicker and um, it's, it's definitely ha it, it's a major toll on our employers their employees and um, the, their livelihoods are at stake here we're going to lose a lot of small businesses if we don't move faster go ahead from mark craycraft uh, where can the public find the list of services open to bids services open to bids we post them downstairs. Um, uh, that's mainly that's mainly it. I mean, we we okay, the, the we put them in the newspaper as well. Yes. Anything that's required. I'm not exactly sure which bids he's talking about, but 
I think maybe specifically because the comment came up when you were talking about next week bid start. Oh, oh yeah, that's always in the newspaper. And matter of fact, all of those bids were talked about in here. We gave approval to for him to move forward with the bids. So that's the process. It's in the newspaper, um, and that's always been the 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 mode for that to be uh, communicated. Uh, Mr. William R. Stevens Jr. would like to know why you're why the medical grade N95 masks in an office environment? Why? Um, because we were given um, an opinion by our assistant prosecutor earlier in the week um, that while um, it has been loosened up for um, private individuals, private uh, companies uh, to make those calls on their own, um, those restrictions are not so loose for government and public uh, buildings. So uh, while the, the uh, general public doesn't necessarily have to wear a mask, even though it's been left up to the employer to make those decisions, um, and that we, we can ask for people to wear them when they come into the building, um, we've left that up to the elected officials, individual elected officials to do so. Um, we ourselves, as employees of the county, have to wear them when we are in the presence of the public, uh, according to the opinion. So that's why, trust me, we, <laughs> we would prefer not to be wearing them right now. And when we are alone in our offices, we are allowed to not wear them, of course. But uh, we, we need to abide by the opinion of our uh, in this case, our attorney, you know, to let us know that who is interpreting those directives that are coming down from the state of Ohio. That's it. You should always listen to your attorney. Sin Mackley. Most of the time. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> we should, yes. Sin Mackley, Saturday County Daily News. Okay. Uh, are you satisfied with how the election was completed? Do you feel that everyone had a chance to make their voice heard? Wow. Um, I don't, boy, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one right there. I, I know there was a lot of uh, people that were confused because of the way it happened. Um, I, I think there was a lot of effort to try to get the word out, this is the way the elections to take place. But you know, not everybody's on Facebook, not everybody listens to the radio not everybody reads the newspaper and even up to the last day there was people asking about where their polling place was and there was no polling place um i think that was the greatest the greatest bit of confusion to most that i heard was there was no physical voting which really threw a lot of people for a loop so uh, i think that was the one part that probably <laughs> impacted the most people because they're just you know we're creatures of habit we're you know if you're if you're a, someone who likes to go to the polls you don't expect that to be changed um, you know I heard people say well I thought it was June 2nd well that was what was thrown out by the Secretary of State at the beginning and uh, the legislature who has the exclusive right to schedule an election is the one who changed it so um, I don't know if satisfied is the word I would use. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I think there was a lot of people that uh, possibly did not get to vote because of the situation, uh, because of the changes. Now, whose responsibility does that lie on as an individual voter? Um, you know, I, I, I can't say one way or another. Um, I, I believe that. As a citizen, uh, we should do our best to stay educated as to what is being asked of us in voting. But in, this was an extreme circumstance. It really was. I pray that we are going to get beyond this um, so that we can go back to the normal way of voting for the general election, which is going to be a very important election. It's a presidential election, and we need to... Uh, get back to the way the Ohioans are used to voting, and hopefully they'll be able to do that soon. Kathy, I don't know if you have 
Anything to add? I, I had a, uh, several, I, I would call them complaints. People thought that they were going to be mailed their ballot and not have to go through the process right. of applying and calling in for an application to apply for a ballot. Um, then there were the deadlines. And as you said, the, the difference between urban areas and rural areas uh, are vast uh, uh, difference there. There's a lot of people who don't subscribe to the papers they can't afford to, to subscribe. They, they don't have Wi-Fi and, and different things. So I, I pray that uh, by the time the general comes around, all these flaws and, and things will be corrected and, and considered and corrected. And I will add one other thing, too, is that our local board of elections did the best they could mm -hmm. given what they were, exactly the directives that came from the state. Everybody needs to understand that, you know, the decisions that were made were not made at the local level. That's right. Um, again, these were edicts, directives uh, that were passed down from Columbus, and I know our board of elections workers worked very hard, very hard to work with people. But again, it was imperfect situation. It really was. And uh, that's one thing that we've learned through this entire pandemic, that it has created challenges of uh, magnitudes I don't think a lot of people could have, could have predicted. Um, so it need, the lesson we need to learn, and matter of fact, I think Sin might have even asked us the other day, is what was the lessons learned from this pandemic? Or were there lessons learned? Is either her or Betty Smith one of those two asked the question, this is another great example, you know, how do you prepare for something like this? And if, and how do you educate the public in advance that this is the protocol if this happens again? That's the one thing about the general election, they need to get ahead of it and start educating the public now if there's gonna be any changes. Can they do that at the beginning of May with an election that's being held in November? Well, that's a long way off, but I don't know. Uh, I think the proof's in the pudding that the sooner you start educating, the better off you're going to be and you're going to be able to get more response. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Sin Mackley again. Are there any plans to facilitate making masks available for those who can't afford them or would the county leave that up to local charities? Um, actually, the county's, as an employer, we're making sure that our employees have them. Uh, there are masks at the front entrance. Um, I know the big thing is, is there, there's such a lack of them now, still. Uh, we, we're still scavenging basically to find masks. Um, one, or, one of the things I'm seeing is just the people that are doing it individually are doing a wonderful job. Um, I, one of the questions we've been asking EMA is how can we find more masks? We want to be able to buy them. You, you can't hardly find them. They're, they're, there's hardly any out there. So um, I don't think that really answers our question. There's no plans for the county to buy masks for 70, you know, six or 77,000 people. No, but, um, but we are making sure that county offices are covered. Uh, as are, I'm sure, other businesses making sure that their employees are covered per the directive. And then each an individual citizen has to make a choice on what they want to do, uh, whether they want to wear them or not in public. And uh, they're facing the same problem we are, is finding them. You know, there's a, there's a major shortage. Even yet today, there's a major shortage. So a lot of people are making their own. Uh, so I know a lot of people are getting them that way. Sin Mackley again. You had been confident that the governor would increase the reimbursement or indigent defense. With the statewide budget cuts, are you concerned about how much of that bill the county will be stuck with? Sure. I mean, we're always concerned about those changes. We've seen it go up. We've seen it go down. Um, we, we fully expect um, that with the budget cuts that the governor has already requested, um, that, um, that no doubt um, energy defense would probably be impacted by that, possibly. Uh, the legislature has a say in that. Uh, we'll see. 
you know, the, the image defense being revised was one of the things that um, the General Assembly did to offset some of the MCO losses. So hopefully they won't reverse that. Um, we shall see and see where that goes. But of course, of course, we have to be concerned that that, that might change. Now, how much indigent defense has happened in the last two months? Not a whole lot. Um, not, you know, because we haven't had jury trials. We haven't had a lot of court, court operations going on. So in that way, you have an offset there. Um, but yet, well, that's the other thing, you know, a lot of inmates were released as well, uh, nonviolent offenders, things like that. So there's, a, there's been a reduction in cost as well during this period of time. How much, we'll see. We'll see come, because uh, we just did, the reimbursement we just did, that was for January. They're always running four months, five months behind. So, so we'll see four or five months from now how much of an impact it had. Uh, Melissa Bennett, when will the official election results be released? Um, the Board of Elections uh, informed me uh, that on May 12th, um, the, the, law, the law is this, um, every Board of Elections by law must meet no less than, no less than 10 days after an election. Uh, what that is, is that's kind of like a, uh, a period of calm where any outstanding ballots, they're finding their way into the office. In this case, it was very important because you had individuals mailing ballots in literally the day before the election. In our area, there's no way those ballots arrive the next day because they have to go to Columbus, they have to get processed, and they come back. So we had ballots, Sioux County Board of Elections saw ballots coming in Literally, they saw them coming in the day of the election. They saw them coming in the day after the election. I don't know about after that, but I'm sure there was still some trickling in from here and there. And they have the provisional ballots. Those are separate. Uh, I believe there was 178 provisionals. I'm not 100% sure about the numbers. That's all Board of Elections stuff. Um, that's not something we're responsible for. That's all the board. They literally have a board over the Board of Elections, and then you have the election workers that work in the office. They will meet on May 12th. My understanding is they will process all the remaining ballots. That includes your provisionals and anything that was mailed in by the 17th. Is that right? I believe it was, yes. And, um, and then they will uh, accumulate all of those numbers, and they'll announce it. They should announce it on the 12th of May. One more just popped up, sorry. What do you mean by indigent defense will be impacted? Um, the reimbursement may be impacted. The act of indigent defense, meaning having the access to an attorney will not. Um, the reimbursement rate may be impacted. So instead of 85% reimbursement, um, you know, maybe they'll reduce that to 80. 70 we've seen it as low as 40 mm -hmm. um, which means that is more money out of the general fund because that's where the reimburse uh, that's where indigent defense comes from it's reimbursement if we pay out a hundred thousand dollars then if they say we're going to repay you back at 85 percent we get eighty five thousand dollars of that back but that fifteen thousand comes out of the general fund if they reduce that rate that's more coming out of the general fund that's less money that the county has for essential services, things like that, that goes toward paying energy defense. Energy defense is guaranteed by our Constitution, that each and every person has the right to, to a defense and have access to an attorney in our uh, constitutional republic. So that is something that's guaranteed by law. Um, what we're talking about is the impact will be on the dollars that are spent. Uh, or not reimbursed. So, but definitely, indigent defense is a guaranteed thing in our Constitution, Constitutional Republic. What else, sir? That's it? Okay, all right. Well, thank you everyone for watching. Um, 
I know we've had a lot of people watching here lately, a lot going on. I think uh, we've been the only meeting in town <laughs> for a while now. That's getting ready to change. Um, I know Portsmouth City Council's getting fired up to go on Monday again, and we're glad uh, to hear that. Uh, we've been working with them on the PACE finance, uh, getting the PACE district set up in Portsmouth, which is going to be great for economic development in Portsmouth as well. So we're very excited about that. With that, do we have a motion? Yes, I'll make the motion to adjourn. Okay, I'll second. Ms. Coleman. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day. <laughs>